every week. All right, thank you so much, Aiko. Well, hello, everyone. I am Leo Dong from Education for Our Foundation. Uh, I'm the Education Department Executive along with Harvey here. Uh, and yeah, we basically run the main operations in EFA here. Uh, I am 16, I'm from Orange County, Irvine. And I go to Santa Margarita Catholic High School. And yeah, take it away, Harvey. Yeah, uh, thank you guys so much. It's nice having everyone here. I am Harvey Wei. I am a 12th grader in Chicago, Illinois, in the US. Yeah, I'm also an education department executive at EFA. Yeah, okay, thank you, Harvey. Okay, so let's get right into it. Yeah, wherever you're from, thank you so much for coming and, um, you know, just please enjoy this presentation. Uh, we hopefully made it as entertaining as possible for you guys. So, you know, stick with us and, you know, guess what you'll find. Yeah. All right. So uh, why don't we start off by, you know, stating the vision and mission of why, you know, Education for All Foundation is doing this. You know, we, this is our mission statement that we envision a world where students utilize their unique talents to create a positive impact in the lives of all of those in need. So um, this very, very, you know, broad and ambitious statement, it came, came from, you know, four years of kind of operations and stories and, you know, just heartwarming experiences from our teachers and everything. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Okay. How we have boiled down from all of these crazy experiences to this mission statement through stories. So hang in there. We'll get right into it. Okay. So um, how do we get started? How, you know, how did EFA get founded? So um, unfortunately today, our executive director, Alex, who is, you know, suffering from the aftermath of Hurricane Ida. So he cannot be here today due to Wi-Fi issues, but, you know, um, he, along with a group of ambitious high school students, went to this little province in Ningxia, China called Dagoyan Village, right there on the dot on the world map, as you can see there. Um, he went there to uh, that summer it, having the ambition and goal to help out as many people as he can on that trip. And that's exactly what he did. Um, and, you know, when he got there, he met a lot of students. So, um, you know, obviously villagers, they have students, right? they have kids and they have children. And, you know, these kids are the most wonderful people ever. I, I remember like, cause they didn't have English names. So we had to name quite a lot of few of them. And I, trust me, I named a lot of them Leo. And, you know, I remember like one of those Leos, they were, he was like five years old or six year old. Like he, he should have started like kindergarten, but like the there's not a lot of kindergartens there. Um, and, you know, he's just the most adorable kids ever. He will be like, come to me and ask for lollipops and like candy and all that kind of stuff. And it's just the most amazing, you know, kind of atmosphere and thing ever. And, you know, these kids, they're really, really wonderful. They are just like any other kid in the world. You know, they deserve every single opportunity they can. And, you know, um, they're really great. And we saw that, you know, we saw them. We, we, we see them. Okay. And, you know, but behind that, you know, kind of fantasy, not, not fantasy, but like, you know, that, that cuteness and everything comes a cruel reality is that you know, a lot of them are suffering from poverty, right? Um, if you look on the left-hand side, that is one typical, not even a house, a, a cave that one of these students live in. Uh, you know, we, we go to museums to see prehistoric human, you know, living caves and all that stuff. While it, it really is happening right now in, unfortunately in China, that a lot of these people don't have the necessary, you know, housing or infrastructure to support them. You know, although there is a TV in the house, I, I, I it's safe to assume they don't have, you know, air conditioning and it gets pretty hot in Yingxia, especially because it's kind of near the equator. So, um, it, they, they do definitely lack a lot of, you know, kind of resources and everything. And on the right hand side, you guys can see the road. There is no road, <laughs> you know, there's just dirt pond and dirt. So, uh, you know, I, like I said, their infrastructure and you know, everything is definitely not up to, you know, Western standards or, you know, even Eastern like Chinese standards. Um, so, you know, we, we thought about this, we went there with a, goal in mind was to help as many people as we can. And we thought, what better way to help them than help the next generation, right? So um, we thought about it, right? We, we obviously can't provide them with money 
all we, we first of all we don't have all the money in the world and we did it, it's just not sustainable right obviously we can't just keep sending them books you know or water or food or whatever that that just doesn't seem sustainable and that's what the idea came to us we give them the power of education and that's exactly what we did we donated books we gave them the power of education we taught them english and that's that's how EFA was formed from that destined trip in 2018, the summer of 2018, when we went to Ningxia, China. And as you can see, there are a bunch of kids reading books, you know, eager to learn. Um, during that summer, uh, we taught, that is me right there with a nasty haircut, <laughs> along with Sean, one of the uh, founder of EFA, and we were teaching lessons there, um, you know, in that summer, we really tried out, you know, what we can do there and what we can't. And we found that we can do anything, you know, like basically we can teach them along with their curriculum, but also teach them with our own, you know, Western cultural influence uh, curriculum with like fun extracurriculars or projects and all that kind of stuff. I did teach them how to rap. Like that's, I'm still proud of that to this very day. <laughs> and that is so fun. Um, and you know, it's just the best thing ever. And I remember what this one student, Kevin, uh, from one of these classes um, from the village, he, he's like a third grader, I think, but he, he's like the most active, you know, he's like the, uh, the active student in class, right? And like, whenever I say something, he's like, oh, I know this elephant, uh, tiger, and, you know, stuff like that. It, like, it's the most amazing thing ever. And like, you know, he's really great in class. But something about him that astonished me was that after class, right, after our class, he went around the corner and gathered up all the younger children in the village and taught them how to speak English. Right? Isn't that, isn't that crazy? Like, I, when I saw that, I was like, oh, my God, that's we are impacting lives that we never imagined we would. And we are actually changing someone's destiny by giving them the power of knowledge on English. And, you know, I, I, at that moment I was, I was shocked and I was empowered and, you know, I, it was just, it was just one of the most amazing moments I had at EFA and I like to share with you guys. So, um, as you can see here, this is one, this is a lesson we had in summer of 2018, but obviously as much as we wanted, we couldn't stay there forever. Uh, we couldn't stay in Ningxia, the village forever. We had to come back to either America or Canada. So, you know, we switched to a online model, uh, as you can see there, uh, our lovely teachers uh, teaching classes via a uh, Zhumu. That's like a Chinese version of Zoom. Uh, and yeah, that's how our operation got started. And as you can see under there, that's one of like our prep kind of documents there to kind of uh, teach them how to, uh, you know, the knowledge that they need. Uh, I think right there, we're teaching about geography, <laughs> which is great because no one likes geography. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, you know, uh, that, that's, that's how it went down. Um, and all right. So I know I started my story in the summer of 2018, but, you know, it, it was July 2019 when we actually started, you know, expanding and actually getting serious. Um, you know, in the July of 2019, we expanded into three regions. Uh, it's Jiangxi, Inner Mongolia, and Chongqing, as you can see here. Um, the four dots on there, this is Ningxia, and this is, you know, the four dots. Uh, but, um, yeah, this is this is when we actually started to see, you know, if we can impact more people and, you know, see if we can get to more impoverished children and change their lives, potentially, you know, if we can. So, uh, you know, progressing through time, we launched a teaching team, we launched the EDGE program, fundraiser, permanent teachers. And to this day, um, you know, the 2021, we have over 29 teachers. Oh, no, sorry. We have over 29 weekly classes with 500 plus students. And we raised over $20,000 um, thanks to all of our amazing volunteers and donors. Um, I, think, I think these numbers convey not only just how big we've grown, but also that people believe in our mission, that you know, people are passionate about helping people, that there is good in the world. Um, you know, when we see these impoverished students in, in China, that we are willing to help them. Um, and that, that really gives me chills. Just by speaking, I, I already feel chills, you know, <laughs> tingling down my spine. Um, and if we do believe that there is still good in the world, 
we can do something about it. You know, we can gather gather up these people and, you know, really help them. And that's exactly what EFA is all about. You know, we can do this together to help these students um, on their way to their success. All right, uh, anyways, uh, so going over the, some of the numbers, like I said before, we have 40 plus teachers, not 29, I'm sorry about that, 40 plus teachers with 500 plus students and 29 weekly lessons uh, with nine partner schools. Um, I think these numbers, you know, uh, mask a lot of the, eff uh, like, yeah, shows a lot of the efforts uh, we put into, you know, just expansion and, you know, Harvey here loves expansion because he's the one doing outreach and everything. So yeah, he... Uh, He's currently in contact with a lot of other schools and, you know, we're just really proud of what we accomplished and, you know, just really see the impact we have made so far. Okay, so um, Harvey will actually kind of talk about this in the in later slides, but we do have three teaching team, uh, sorry, three teams in the education departments. The first is teaching, curriculum and training. So teaching, obviously self-explanatory. Curriculum is the one that makes like the mater educational materials. And then training is the uh, basically uh, training our new incoming teachers, the 40 plus teachers to keeping them up to standards and giving them the resources they need to give out quality education uh, to our students. So um, our teaching team, yeah, um, like I said before, these are kind of our teaching method is to use uh, is to use slides and uh, basically uh, teach through Jumu and uh, online. Uh, sorry about the Slack message. Uh, but yeah, um, basically they, they yeah, they teach the students in class. A lot of our students actually uh, don't have a set classroom. They for, for some reason, they do have phones and Wi-Fi, which is very fortunate. <laughs> and, you know, a lot of our teachers just teach through kind of a group setting like they join on zoom and kind of all that stuff and you know that sometimes can create chaos because uh, <laughs> these kids don't know how to use technology and you know sometimes it will be like hey can you change your name to this can you change your name to that but you know uh fun stuff happens all the time uh here at efa uh I, oh i remember one kid who uh was just like like he, he was like the you know the active kid in class and like he always wanted eager he was always eager to speak in class but his like brother was like screaming in the background because like he has like a little brother I was like baby brother and everything it was like, it was crazy but like I keep on muting him but like he, he keeps on unmuting himself and like just it was like he got a little chaotic at the end so like I I, I know right? <laughs> I had to ask him be like oh can you like please mute yourself I know you're like I know you want to speak but like please mute yourself because we can hear your brother in the background but yeah um our teaching operation is really great we teach them a basic English knowledge like grammar reading all that fun stuff you should learn in elementary school um <clears throat> I know grammar right who wants to learn grammar but you know we teach these things through a pretty creative method we you know play games with them have projects with them you know get them engaged with you know all the different methods we can think about like video games or like videos or like actually videos that we create you know and stuff like that so uh it's it's pretty great our teachers have a lot of fun teaching classes and the students obviously have a lot of fun um you know, enjoying these lessons. So uh, yeah, that's about it for our teaching team. Um, yeah, so Harvey, do you want to take these? Yeah, sure. So uh, as Leo mentioned, by the way, I'm Harvey, the other education department exec. And yeah, so as Leo covered before, uh, as we expanded to all these different schools, we needed a bigger team. And so we've uh, started recruiting volunteers, volunteer teachers, and we've targeted youth volunteer teachers. So people who are in high school, or university, maybe just graduate university, or even I think we have one or two from middle school. So why do we recruit youth volunteer teachers? Well, first, they all have a real passion for this. So a lot of our teachers are actually immigrants or people who have lived in China and an English speaking country. So they have really experienced both the Chinese culture and another culture. And through that experience, a lot of them have learned English as a second language, language themselves. So because of that, that experience, you're not only able to empathize, empathize with our students and understand the difficulties that they're going through while learning English. For example, when I, so I, uh, myself, I am an immigrant. I moved to the US from China in fifth grade and I did learn English as a second language. And I know that I, for the longest time, I struggled to differentiate the, um, um, the difference between TH and S, the pronunciation. So like Leo is a big singer. If we have time, he can sing for us. Uh, but then I'll be like, hey, Leo, can you sing for us? And then he'll be like, what? And I'll be like, oh, it's sing. So 
just a lot of little things that <laughs> our teachers understand all of the little things that struggle students may struggle with in their English learning process. At the same time, because they've experienced both cultures, they're able to relate to students in a Chinese cultural context while also giving them a perspective into, uh, into life in another country, which is super important as I will cover a little bit later on. And it's not like we just wrote these youth volunteer teachers, <laughs> youth volunteer teachers into a classroom because frankly, it's, um, it's actually a bit difficult, especially in a Zoom setting. So we actually provide, and uh, Leo talked about the training bit, team a little bit before, but we actually give our uh, volunteer teachers four weeks of teacher training with one or two workshops per week in order to prepare them for the classroom and to most effectively teach our students. And our training process is designed through some of our own experiences as well as input from an ESL professional. So throughout the training process, our teachers really learn how to engage students, how to make sure they're on par with all the information concepts, you know, the grammar, vocabulary, make sure they know everything and know how to teach it and what activity to use to uh, and practice to use for the students to enforce the, the learning, as well as how to use multimedia to engage students in the classroom. So yeah, volunteer teacher, youth volunteer teachers. And throughout this process, we really saw how, we we're really surprised actually by how many people applied and how many people are interested in this and to develop their time because this is not a light commitment. So they have um, team meetings every week in addition to one or two classes per week. So they're really giving a lot of time to this, which we were, and they really enjoy the classes as well, which we were really surprised, I guess, and pleasantly surprised. And um, yeah, glad for. So yeah, next, uh, next slide, please. Yeah, so this is just a very short video of our uh, operations last October. There's a bit of lessons in there. So yeah, could you also share some?你的方向怎么写反正是一个人就行了然后呢小写的呢就像刚丽丽老师说的小写的呢就要比较小所以你要把它写成这样子小朋友们都抄好了吗好那我们再最后读一遍<笑> <笑>好那我们的第二个单词你有两个星期没见了想我们了吗啊好的我们也想你们了然后好巧我在班上都一直在那里吹老师都<笑><笑> 让我因为他是因为那个万圣节不然的话他都会把我赶出去哎呀看你的腿在那上面我的天谢谢同学们<笑> 谢谢蒋老师谢谢蒋老师谢谢谢谢谢谢谢谢谢谢谢谢谢谢谢谢谢谢谢谢谢谢谢谢谢谢谢谢谢谢谢谢谢谢谢谢谢谢谢谢谢
you know, we just want to get the information across. We want to teach the students the basics of English and just, you know, grammar concepts and writing. I think this is this um, this side of slides has a bunch of writing prompts that students can practice off of. But as we got to know the students and as we develop the program, we realized that since the students are mostly located in some a lot of rural villages, a lot of, a lot of them have never traveled outside of villages or come in contact with anything, any cultures from around China or around the world, we realized that, you know, we can, because of our global perspective, because, because of a lot of our um, experiences abroad, we can actually help students develop that, um, that perspective. So we, uh, we started putting in a lot of uh, cultural anecdotes and little facts in our lessons that are, that students may not know or learn in their everyday lives. So as you can see on top, we're teaching about numbers in this lesson, but we talk about the number 30, we talk about a bit of Christianity, a bit of, you know, Renaissance art. It's um, just fascinating things that the students would uh, enjoy knowing. And then on the bottom here, I think this is made by one of our Canadian volunteers about winter sports and winter pastimes in Canada, which I did not know about uh, before I saw this lesson. So yeah, and our curriculum team is, our curriculum itself is based off of um, the Chinese local English curriculum, but it's only based off of the grammar and the informational concepts of those. Since when you are starting to learn English, uh, most curriculums are about the same. You know, you cover the alphabet, you cover phonics, you cover the basic words, animals, numbers, that kind of thing. So just to get a, um, a set amount of uh, basic knowledge, we, we use Chinese curriculum, but all the activities, all the anecdotes, all the ways that we enforce and homework as well. We enforce the knowledge um, we create ourselves with input from, with a dedicated curriculum team. I think we have around 20 to 30 people on the curriculum team right now, led by um, our colleagues. And yeah, our, another special thing about our curriculum team is that our, the volunteers actually make lessons in pairs. So each week they're assigned um, a lesson with a partner to make. And through that process, they not only you know, get to make a lesson, they also meet new people. They switch partners every week or two weeks. So they actually meet other volunteers and through that, out, that lesson making process, get to know the other volunteer who may be you know, of a different age, go to a different school, live in a different location. It's just a really good experience. It's just a really good chance for volunteers to meet new people as well. And a lot of people have said that they've met you know, a lot of new friends while making curriculum and teaching. So that is always very, um, very good to hear. Next slide, please. Yeah, so I guess, why English? Why teach English out of all the subjects that we can to the Chinese schools? Well, first it provides a really great job market advantage. So I think less than 1% of the Chinese population is fluent in English and the world being much more globalized and technology connecting us is much more developed right now. It is um, essential or not really essential, but will really give the students a lot of advantage if they are to try to get out of their rural villages, you know, looking for jobs and as well as pass the Gao Call, which is the Chinese college entrance exam. So just have been that, hopefully our goal, which um, we are still working on right now is getting our students to that 1%. It will give them massive job market advantage and in, when they look for jobs after college. And second is a global perspective. So since everyone here is from a lot of different places, I'm sure you guys can understand that um, being living in a different country or talking and knowing people from a different culture, from a different background as you can really give you a much better understanding of the world and just get a lot, um, just embrace a lot of the globalization that is in the world right now. And our students being in rural villages have not had that chance. So we really strive to give that you know, global view and understanding of global cultures to our students. And lastly is critical thinking. So this is something that we find particularly important to our students because a lot of their, um, I guess the nature of the Chinese education system is that there's a lot of memorization. There's a lot of you know, studying to pass tests. 
whether and it, it's not just limited to STEM subjects, you know, memorizing formulas for math or for physics. It's also in the um, in liberal in the liberal arts as well. So, for English, I know when I was in elementary school in uh, in China for Chinese, I guess yeah, for language arts. Um, even though we had you know reading comprehension problems, you know free response problems, there's only one right answer. So, for example, what the author is trying to convey in this passage there's only one right answer. So what often ends up happening is that the students only memorize that one correct answer and they memorize it and they read so much that they memorize every answer to every single passage instead of actually critically reading that passage and forming their own conclusion about what the author is trying to say. So um, in our classes, we try to ask a lot of open-ended questions. We try to have a lot of discussions and a lot, of, um, a lot of chances for students to form their own opinions. So for, so for example, um, just talking about the cultural comparison. comparison. Once I think um, one of our lessons is themed around student, or one of our units really, is themed around student life in the United States versus student life in China. So comparing elementary school in the US versus, versus China. So we actually, um, I think our teachers talk about their own experience, experiences in the US ask our students to share their experiences in China and, and then ask our students to identify the differences. So I'll ask maybe what's, um, what's good and what needs to be improved in both, exp uh, in both student experiences so that they can compare and contrast, but also gain that critical thinking skill, which is, um, which is really important. So yeah, a lot of discussions and that is why we teach English. So what are some of EFA's goals in terms of English education in 2021, the latter half of 2021, I should say. So first of all, in China, we are looking to expand to 1,500 new students, I mean, total students, excuse me, around seven new schools in many different provinces, as well as grades one through seven. So the, uh, in China, great elementary school is grades one through six. So we're going to be teaching middle school as well which is gonna be really exciting. And we're also planning some international expansion. Um, a huge shout out to MU and Impact and the wonderful people here for connecting us with um, some schools. Yeah, Malaysia. Some schools in Malaysia, Bangladesh, India, and Pakistan. So obviously those operations will be a little bit different, but we are still um, seeking to recruit youth volunteer teachers and teach English or maybe some other subjects as well as the global perspective to our students. So yes, next slide, please. All right, and the next thing is our other main operation, EDGE department. Next slide, please. So in EDGE, the goal is to um, provide students with a trusted mentor and a big brother or big sister or someone they can just, they can believe in and someone they can, a, a friend who they can really, um, bond with. Because our students, a lot of our students are in the rural villages, and a lot of them are actually uh, left behind, the term is, which means that their, um, their parents work in, go to work in big cities while the students remain in the rural villages living with their um, relatives or grandparents. And the parents only actually um, come home maybe once every two or three months and only stay for a couple of days and they have to go off to work again. So these students, they, um, they don't get to see a lot of their parents. And obviously we know that their great grandparents, their aunts and uncles really love them. They're still not really that, um, that parental influence. And that provides a lot of challenges for our students in that they don't really have a lot of um, people to talk to or a lot of, um, I guess, older people as a mentor role. So because of that, we, saw, we thought that, you know, um, in high schools, at least in American high schools, we have we have school counselors and we have big body programs. So why not create one for our students in China as well? So we've um, at the start we chose a couple really mature volunteers and we actually recruited help of a professional trained um, psychologist to help train these volunteers into in conversing with students, really reaching out to them, and providing a friend friendship role. In our students. So as you can see in the top right corner, um, these are this is one of our sessions. You see two of our students, and um, on the top right corner of that top right picture is Angel Law, our Edge Department executive. 
And here she is having a one-on-one -on -one session with our students, which is typically how most of our edge sessions run. So they meet once a week and the mentors and um, one or two students, it's mostly one student, have an hour conversation to talk about basically anything they want, you know, how students' lives is going, you know, what, um, you know, fun stories, what the students, maybe some challenges the students is expecting. And yeah, just um, throughout this process, the students really share about their lives and the Edge Mentor provides a listening ear as well as some guidance if necessary for the students. So yeah, as you can see on the bottom right, um, these are, I think, our students from last year and yeah, uh, we had seven students last year. This year, I think um, currently actually, because school just started on September 1st, we're going to have 31 students at one school in, uh, what's it, in the province of Jiangxi. All right. And in addition to heartfelt bonding, we are also trying, we have also bought equipment for our students via the Edge team because, well, it's one-on-one -on -one, uh, bonding. So each student needs their own device which we have provided for them through fundraising as well, which is exciting. All right, next slide, please. Yeah, so our edge department, the main goal of this department is to help students develop transferable skills through expanding worldviews and motivating new passion through how felt personal bonding and mentorship sessions. And yeah, so I'd like to do a little activity with everyone. So as you can see, this is a picture. So it would be great if everyone can text in the chat what you think this little girl is feeling or thinking at this moment. And there's no correct answer. So please, just the first word or words or sentence that pop into, pops into your mind. So is she sad? Is she pondering? Alone? Sadness? Calm? Wow. She's hungry. <laughs> Okay, a lot of different responses here, I love it. <laughs> she is killing an ant. Oh my God, okay. Let's do the bar turn. All right, anyone else? Um, she's waiting for someone, that's a good one. Reminds me of that scene from um, the Shawshank Redemption when the guy goes on a tree and digs up. She's drawing something. Uh, definitely. It looks like a swirl on the ground. All right. All right. Wow. He is lonely too, I guess. So as you can see, there's a lot of killing time. Fantastic. There's a lot of different responses. And looking for something falling. That's also awesome. That's also true. So I guess the, um, the thing I'm trying to get at here, here is everyone has different interpretations life and it really sh it's really important for us to see this different perspectives and how different people can view things in a different way and that is really the essence of edge you know sharing the different perspectives and sharing through conversations we develop how um develop the ways in which uh i guess not really develop but get to know how other people are feeling and what other people how other people see this even though even be seeing the same things, how other people see them. To get to um, have a different perspective and to really expand your own worldview as well. All right, next slide, please. All right, so the future plans for Edge, um, expanding more schools, including middle schools. So middle schools, the students, um, there's also left behind schools, students at um, the middle school we're partnering with. Next semester, we're hoping to expand to them as well to help out these students. Next is establish a partnership with a supplier for stable equipment provision. So for example, laptops, headsets, headphones. So right now we have, um, we have a financial team who do a lot of fundraising online and hold some events. And we use the, those funds to purchase um, equipment for our students. So however, we're still purchasing off like Taobao, which is the Chinese version of Amazon. So we are looking for kind of a more economical option for that. And next, we would also like to increase student interaction between schools. So half hours different. Um, so from our middle school students, our elementary school students to maybe even other elementary school students we're teaching or where we're mentoring. 
in order for them to form that social chemistry and that group chemistry in addition to a friendship with our um, with our mentors and for them to have more real well I guess yeah in person and real life friends as well so yeah, that is edge and next oh yeah and next is our partnership with MU and impact so again a huge shout out to MU and impact for having us here today and for you know really helping us with all of our operations so MU impact has provided us with connections in China and other countries Bangladesh Malaysia India and other places and um, I know a lot of the team here has helped us so much with promoting SDG goals for um, you know quality education and um, getting rid of poverty and yeah and we hope to help achieve SDG four before 2030 as well. So thank you so much Immune Impact couldn't do this without you guys. And next uh, just say actually let, let's skip this slide for now. We can come back to it later. Okay, so just a parting thought we would like to leave everyone with if you're going to take one thing away from this presentation is that everyone can make a change. And we believe that because in 2018, when we started, we were just high schoolers who have had no experience teaching English or working with local principals or working with Chinese students or holding virtual lessons that was way before COVID-19 started. So yeah, we had zero experience whatsoever. But we still went out there and explored and you know really tested out our operations and we made a lot of stumbles really. And we faced a lot of challenges, you know, schools wouldn't respond to us. Um, our teachers were <laughs> untrained, so they would go into a classroom and they would just start. I know I did that at the start a lot. You should um, yeah, it was it was very embarrassing. But through that experience, we were we still, you know, we still tested our operations, we still went on and we still saw a lot of help from mentors. So whether it is from local principals, local teachers, you know, seeking feedback on how we can better engage with students, how we can better get the material across to seeking mentors outside of um, our organization. So whether that is a psychologist or a ESO professional, or maybe even fundraising help, just being able to go out there, you know, outreach and believing that you know, it doesn't matter how much experience you have. It doesn't matter what age you are, whether you're in middle school or high school or an adult or 70, 80 years old, you can still make a change as long as you, um, as long as you want to. And as long as you have a, um, a, a, you find a group of people who are willing to make that change with you and to help you on that journey. So yeah, everyone can make a change. I encourage everyone to, um, I know you guys do a lot of this in MU Impact as well, but look into your own communities, see what, you can, see what you can improve on, see where you can make a change and go out there and do it. All right, thank you so much for being here for our presentation. Really appreciate you guys. And if you guys are interested in any way, and we, really, we would really appreciate any help you guys can bring to our operations, whether it is you live in a different country or with our English education operations, as well as anything else, um, international expansion, things like that. Please, please go, feel free to check out our website, um, follow us on Instagram and Facebook at EFA Global, as well as reach out to Leo and myself. I think our emails are in the chat with any questions or anything you have. So yeah, thank you guys so much. Yeah, and, cool. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Arvi. Yeah, so um, that is the end of our presentation. So if you have any questions or anything, you guys can go ahead and ask. Uh, this is like our Q&A session. So yeah, please feel free to ask and we'll answer to the best of our abilities. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, anything, you guys? If not, yeah, feel free to type in chat, raise your hands or anything. Yes, Ray. Yes, Ray. Yeah. All right. Um, okay. First of all, thank you, Leo and Harvey, for that amazing presentation. Uh, I just had a quick question regarding the curriculum development that I, I know Harvey also mentioned how um, in the Chinese education system, there's this sort of fixation on testing. And also, as I also used to be a, a student in that public system too, so I can totally resonate with that. So I guess my question regarding EFA's curriculum development process is, how exactly do you guys maybe balance um, aligning yourself with the Chinese curriculum because the students are going to be eventually taking the Gaokao 
and kind of letting them know that learning is a lot more than just a test score or memorizing a text or I guess a piece of poetry. Yeah, very great question, Ray. Really appreciate it. So um, we made sure that we cover all of the, um, I guess, the knowledge concepts that the students need to know that is identified in the textbook and the Chinese syllabus. So whether that is you know, grammar or certain vocabulary words or sentence structures or things like that, we make sure students understand that. And we, we those really are the, the I guess, knowledge base of our lessons. But at the same time, we try to get a lot of critical thinking activities and things like that through games and anecdotes and discussions, as I mentioned before. So really still sticking to the, the, I guess the Chinese syllabus, but teaching that syllabus in our own way through activities and games. Yeah, All right, thank you. Thank you. Uh, so um, for those who may be wondering about your international programs, like the ones in Bangladesh and Malaysia, and also the one in China, um, are there any positions that you guys have open that we could apply for if, you want, if we would like to help out with you guys? Yeah, absolutely. So um, right now we are focusing on India and expansion to India and Bangladesh. And we've just formed a team in those two countries. We've actually done a bit of outreach to schools. And I think um, our Bangladesh operations are set to schedule to start in two or three weeks. And India is a bit later next month. So however, I think there are application portals on our, um, so we're looking for you know, people for that starting team. And really and at, this, um, at this point in time, we would appreciate any help. So whether that you have experience in those countries you know, or you have experience teaching, or developing curriculum, we appreciate. We would appreciate any of those, and it'd be great if you can speak local languages as well. Yeah. And ask you how to. Yeah. Leo, sorry, sorry, no, no, I thought you were. I'm so sorry about that, Harvey. Go ahead. Yeah, no worries, no worries. So, as you how to apply, um, you can check out our website. There is, um, I think, get involved page and apply now. So you can go into um those places, and yeah, apply there, and also email. You can also just email Leo or myself, and we can get you set up as well. So yeah. Yeah, and to like name a few um, kind of uh, specific positions, we are looking to recruit teachers, uh, like Harvey said, in our um, like international branch, but also like uh, our Chinese branch. So if you speak Chinese, yeah, unfortunately for our Chinese branch, like the prerequisite will be that you have to speak Chinese. Um, so if you are interested in that, definitely we're looking to do that. And yeah, we obviously offer volunteer hours and everything, but you'll be joining a great communities when you join us. Uh, but for non-Chinese speakers, um, there are other positions on the marketing team and financial team. I know marketing team is recruiting for, I think, video production uh, members. So if you're interested in doing that, like in video production, then definitely go ahead and apply to us. Um, also that uh, I think marketing is also looking for maybe, oh, financial team also looking for some members. But, uh, you know, there are definitely a lot of roles that are non-Chinese speaking. So um, definitely you can join us. So. Um, yes, yeah, so uh, I see a lot of people in chat, uh, you know, applying for Indian branch. Uh, you guys can email Harvey about that. Um, and yeah, just let him know how to do it. And thank you, Lois, for that great question. Yeah, yeah. that's another minimum age. Um, there really is no, I guess, minimum age. So as long, I guess, um, obviously, well, it really depends on the person. So if you're, if you're willing and you're interested, and you're, you know, you're really wanting to dedicate time to this, then anyone is um, What's it? Uh, anyone is welcome to. Yeah, yeah. Uh, if you yeah. like, if you're like first grade and you know how to teach, and you know you can come. You know <laughs> that would be great. You'll be our first first grade teacher. So, uh, that that's amazing. Uh, okay. Uh, I I think I don't want to put your name like Anwar. I, I don't know how to say it, but I, I'm sorry if I said it wrong. Uh, so he said, "How do you guys manage to keep your volunteer motivated in the long run? Is there any incentive credit provided for their volunteer hours?" Okay, that is a really really great question. Um, so uh. We ourselves, we, we don't pride, like, okay, we, we, we don't use volunteer hours as an incentive for our volunteers. Instead, we help them see the importance of our mission and see their impact, um, you know, through their lessons and see the growth that the students have. And I think if you see like a hundred, like cute kids are growing through learning English, if that's not enough to let, help you stay, I don't know what will. <laughs> definitely not the volunteer hours. Uh, I, I think, I think it's important to have our volunteers to really believe in our mission and, you know, exactly. Thank you, Mrs. Barton. Yeah. Intrinsic motivation, uh, to be able to teach our students and, you know, stay with us in the long run. I think that is like a, yeah, 
that's that's our that's our thing you know we we create a loving community and um a community marked with growth and love and progress so yeah yeah thank you for that great question Anwar. all right any any others any others if not i really want to show the news because like last time we didn't get to show it <laughs> come on harry we need to show it we didn't show it all right uh, all right i'm gonna i'm gonna pull it up give me one second uh let me see this uh, yeah so uh... <laughs> Yeah, do you want to like introduce like the context of it? Oh yeah, yeah. So um, we, so since uh, we still have a couple minutes, um, we are. This is uh, a short feature that I think Canadian CTV is it? I think yeah, CTV, the Canadian National Television Channel did on um, EFA a, a couple of months ago, and um, you'll get to meet our executive director Alex as well as um our marketing executive Kelly Jin in there. They will you know it's a it's a very cool video. It's uh, they set up a bar, I think, and drink some coconut milk. I don't think they were at a bar, Harry. I don't think oh. they can't go into a bar. No, like a tropical <laughs> island. Okay, anyways, sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. They're, not, they're not doing anything. Illegal. No, like coconut milk. <laughs> anyways, <laughs> anyways <laughs> let's show the video. Let's see the video. <laughs> Welcome back. Well, a group of Canadian students from Ontario, the Prairies, and all the way to BC are putting their bilingual skills towards helping other students. Many kids in rural areas around the world do not have access to education and learning English. Well, for them, it's just not an option. But these volunteers are looking to change that. And for the past few years, they've been teaching English to students in China. And because of the pandemic, well, the class is in session all via Zoom. Kelly Jin joins me now. She's a high school student teacher as well as Alex, who also joins us, Executive Director of Education for All Foundation. Great to have you both on the program. Hello, Angie. It's wonderful to be here. Kelly, let me start with you first. Talk to us about what you're doing to help kids in China, in rural China, learn English. Well, um, all the magic begins in our English education program. And um, this is our most vital operation at EFA. And through this program, the past year, we've been able to teach over 500 underprivileged students all across rural China. And by September of this year, um, our program will expand to include 1,500 students um, coming from rural schools. And we also have plans to expand to Bangladesh, um, Malaysia, India, and also Pakistan. So um, there are definitely lots of areas where, um, you know, our program is, we've identified the need. Um, and, you know, to answer this question, though, we want to talk about, like, why programs like ours are needed in the first place. So, you know, why uh, do rural students need to be uh, you, you know, want to develop their skills in English education and need to do that. And it all comes down to like um, a very large wealth gap between urban and rural areas mm -hmm. uh, where rural communities um, are suffering, you know, extremely from a severe lack of funding. And what this means for the education system is that schools are unable to hire teachers that can provide English education to the proficiency mm -hmm. that students need to pursue higher education as well as employment. Um, and that is where EFA and our teachers come in. And our teachers hail, um, as you said before, from all across mm -hmm. North America. Um, and, you know, the greatest advantage that we bring is that all of our teachers know English on a native proficiency. Mm -hmm. So when we compare this to, you know, like teachers, local teachers who might have only taken one to two years of English in university, um, you know, this advantage we provide is really bridging the quality that these uh, education that these students receive. Let me bring um, Alex into the conversation on this, um, Kelly. I don't want to run out of time here. But Alex, I mean, you know, Education for All Foundation is doing, you know, a lot reaching out to these kids. How many volunteers do you have or your student teachers do you have um, on board right now? And knowing the uh, incredible need there is around the world, how concerning is that? I think it is very concerning. Um, we currently have around 100 volunteers uh, for the past year who have been constantly teaching and uh, making the curriculum and doing a lot of various supporting jobs as well as teaching the actual classes. Mm -hmm. I think that right now there's a lot of inequalities in the world that stem from education, specifically the entire poverty cycle. Because what it means to be trapped in poverty cycle essentially means that you have less opportunities in life to achieve fulfillment, which I believe is the definition of injustice. Mm -hmm. And I think when I uh, went to their villages a few years ago and listened to the stories of these children, I was shocked because 
if I was in this situation, I would feel completely, utterly helpless and not know what to do. As someone who, you know, lives in Canada, grew up here, I can expect to graduate high school, go to relatively decent college, which mm -hmm. uh, I am going to next year. But for many of these children, they are destined to become either migrant workers or uh, become rice farmers and just not stay in the village for their entire life. And so I think it is a large part of our individual responsibility um, to give more opportunities that we take for granted to these children. Yeah, no, exactly. And I think it's incredible what you guys are, are, are doing using your own skills. Kelly, I've got about 20 seconds left here. Just give me a sense of what it's like for you to be able to do this. Yeah, for me personally, um, it comes from a personal place, the work I do at EFA. Um, you know, my parents grew up in rural um, communities in China, and I have family members who are currently in that education system. So it's really that moment when you realize that even though you're a teen and even though you're young, that you have the opportunity to create a tangible impact on someone's life. Um, the feeling is definitely empowering and just rewarding to say the least. Yeah, I can only imagine. And I know with all the hard work that uh, you're doing, the other volunteers that Alex is doing as well, you're really sort of breaking that cycle of generational poverty, as Alex quite uh, clearly pointed out there, in, in providing these kids with an opportunity for that much-needed education. It's brilliant work that the two of you are doing. Thank you so much for giving us uh, your time to talk about it. Kelly Jin, uh, Alex Hu, thank you both very much. Keep doing what you're doing. We'll stay in touch as, uh, as you continue to expand, expand the program and talk more about it. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. All right. Yeah, that's that's it. I know I wasn't in it. I wanted to be, but uh, they only had allowed two people to be on there. <laughs> so I know Harvey and I both wanted to be on there, but you know, CEO is CEO. So, anyways, uh, that I think that is it for um, today. Harvey, do you have anything else to add? Yeah. Um. Thank you guys so much. And just to answer two of I think the questions in the chat, um, we do not actually currently work with any um, governments or receive any funding. And with a uh, recent anti-China mood in the USA, um, obviously that's been a bit of a challenge, but there's also quite a, um, I guess, a, popu if a population in the US who are willing to contribute and to help this cause. So it's, um, it's actually really heartwarming to see that. Mm -hmm. But yeah. For sure, for sure. Yeah. I mean, uh, it is a humanitarian cause uh, at the end of the day. So I don't, I don't think politics should be in the way of that. So um, yeah. Uh, yeah, and that is it for today. So thank you all so much for coming. Thank you for taking the time in the morning, evening, or afternoon. Uh, thank you guys so much. Um, yeah, and Mrs. Martin, do you want to say something? 